water you turned into wine. You opened the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we Jesus. Lord, we thank you, God. We praise you, Jesus. Lord, we worship you, God. We magnify you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your presence, God. Hallelujah. There is power in the name of Jesus. chain to break every chain to break every chain yes there is power in the name of jesus yes there is power in the name of jesus chain to break every chain to break every chain there's an army rising up oh there's an army rising up yes there's an army rising up yes there's an army rising 
to break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain. There's power. Oh, there is power in the name of Jesus. Yes, there is power in the name of Jesus. He'll break every chain. He'll break every chain. I feel the chains falling. Do you hear them? Hallelujah. Do you hear that all? I hear the chains falling. I hear those chains falling. He'll break every chain, he'll break every chain, he'll break every chain. There is power in the name of Jesus. Yes, there is power in the name of Jesus. Oh, To break every chain, 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 to break every chain. My chains are gone, and I've been set free. My God, my what a mighty God we serve. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. This next song we're going to sing is called Not Afraid. And um, if you were here for Sunday school, you know, God is... is he is so amazing, and how he ties things together and the songs that kind of come together. We don't know what people are going to be talking about, who's going to be teaching, what is going to be taught about. It's amazing how God does things. But this song, the, there's a bridge to it, and it says, you know, before me, behind me, always beside me. And I was looking for it in Scripture, and I found it, and I wanted to read this, what the Scripture says. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me and too great for me to understand. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could, I love this. I, 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 heard, I, didn't really, I haven't really paid attention to this and I love this. I could ask the darkness to hide me. And the light around me to become night. But even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. So when we sing this song, Not Afraid, and we sing that bridge, you think so that God is before you. He is behind you. There is nothing he cannot do. There is no situation he cannot touch. He is greater. Hallelujah. I 
have this confidence because, hallelujah, I've seen the faithfulness of God, the still inside the storm, the promise of the shore, and I trust the power of your word, hallelujah. Enough to seek your kingdom first Beyond the barren place Beyond the ocean wave When I walk through the water I won't be overcome And when I go through the river I will not be drowned For my says you make hallelujah there isn't one that is delayed so I will not lose heart oh I will lift my arms and swim and sing into the night hallelujah situation we're in, God, you are there, Jesus. No matter what circumstance we find ourselves, God, you are there, Lord. You surround us with your love, God. Lord, in our storms, God, you are there. Hallelujah. Lord, we praise you and we thank you, God. Lord, we praise you and thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. Lord, we praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. hallelujah. Lord, we thank you, Jesus. Lord, we praise you.
When I am in the fire, I will not feel the flame. I'll stand before the giant, whatever your giant is. You can declare victory. For our God will make a way. So we don't have to be afraid. Let's sing that again. When I am in the fire, I will not feel the flame. And I'll stand before that giant declaring victory. My God will make a way. So we don't have to be afraid. Hallelujah. Before me, behind me, you're always beside me. No shame. Where you won't find me. No, I am not afraid. Yeah, I got my see. Before me, behind me. You're always beside me. No shadow, no valley. Where you won't find me. No, I am not afraid. No, I Lord, we thank you, God. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Keep giving him praise. There is a powerful presence in this place. I was led to provide the prequel to today's Sunday School lesson to the point where when I was asked, what's the topic? And I gave the topic. And it's, oh, I think that's the Sunday School lesson. No, no, it's, it's the prequel. So. so this is found in Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. I have the ESV, and Malcolm is providing the King James. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling but he was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Please be seated. This passage is about relying on God's power. The disciples believed they saw incredible events, but somehow, somehow, what they observed and participated in firsthand 
did not create in them the ability to trust. We cannot avoid seeing ourselves in these verses as storms certainly thrash against our lives. As we continue to learn what it means to walk with Jesus, these verses also show us and let us see who we are following. While the disciples learn something absolutely amazing about Jesus, we can learn something about ourselves and the storms that we face. I'll be drawing on, on uh, each of the synoptic gospels uh, today, Matthew 8, 23 through 27, Mark 4, 35 to 41, and Luke 8, 22 through 25. The setting of this event is important. The Sea of Galilee sits about 700 feet below sea level. It is about 13 miles long and eight miles wide and can reach depths of 150 feet. What makes it dangerous is that it's surrounded by large hills and mountains. The two large valleys to the west, Wadi Haman and Bayat Natofa, channel cold wind from the mountains into the warm air over the water. And when this happens, there is a potential for the placid waters to quickly become a turbulent sea. Seven-foot waves are not uncommon during these storms. Okay, that's me with Caleb standing on my shoulders tall. Okay, experienced sailors know better than to head out into the Sea of Galilee when they can tell that a storm is rolling in. Common sense. A typical boat on this freshwater sea is relatively small with a single sail of either a lanteen or a square rig. Uh, so you have a mast that goes up and the sail is attached to a boom, but instead of conventional Marconi rig where the boom is on the bottom, this time the boom is on the top. So when you hoist up the sail, you got this piece of wood, and then the sail hangs from it. In a lanteen, one end stays close to the boat, and the other end goes up. In a square rig, the whole thing goes up. You can't tell what it was from the ruins, but you can tell that it was there. A fishing boat from the first century was, was discovered, I was going to say recently, but it's recently to me. It's a long time ago for you. Um, was recently discovered on the, the north shore northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee in 1986. It had a length overall of 27 feet, seven feet, five, uh, six inches at the beam, so not very wide, and three and a half feet draft. Long, narrow, short. It could have carried up to 15 men. I would say that's pretty cramped quarters, but that's what the evidence shows. The boat described in today's Parsha is probably that size. Same size that Brother Wong was talking about this morning. The disciples sailing the boat were certainly experienced mariners. They were fishermen, right? They made their living on this lake there was a good chance that this boat may have actually belonged to one of them. And if they knew that a storm was rolling in, they would not have set out. And when they made for open water, it is safe to suppose they had no idea that they would soon be facing a very fierce storm. Jesus was wrapping up a terrible, horrible no good, very bad day. We know that Mark is a very quick, quick-paced read. You know, I, I've heard it referred to, and I, I've kind of adopted the saying that it's like the science fiction version of, of the Gospels because everything, it's all action, and it's all happening now, it's, and we've got to move on to the next thing because it's... 
This was exciting, but there's more exciting stuff coming, so we've got to keep, 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 keep moving, keep moving. This, this horrible day that we're reading about at the end of chapter 4 started in chapter 3. So much for a very fast-paced read. This is a very long, horrible day. Right? As typical with what in his ministry, he didn't get much rest. We know that from Mark chapter 1, 32 through 35. Okay, so he didn't get much rest the night before. He had to deal with crowds of people. He did not get a, a chance to eat, chapter 3, verse 20. And he had, he had a confrontation with the Pharisees who made the accusation that his power to perform miracles were from the adversary. Hmm. They also accused him of blasphemy, which was punishable by death. The brothers of Jesus, convinced that he was psychologically compromised, came to take him away. Two adrenaline-pumping confrontations virtually back-to-back to say the least, yeah? Which would you consider more intense? The strain within the struggle with the, with the leadership of the religious establishment or the strain of having to deal with your family? Very, very different, but both very powerful. But it wasn't over yet. It wasn't over yet. He healed people of their physical ailments he restored the minds of those who were afflicted by mental illness. He cast out demons from the possessed and then spent the rest of the day teaching crowds, massive crowds of people, the parable of the sower and the parable of the lamp under a basket and the parable of the growing seed, the parable of the mustard seed, and perhaps a few others that were left unrecorded. He then privately explained each of these parables to his disciples. Rabbi, you've taught the masses, now teach me. Right? And he's doing all of this under the heat of the sun in that part of the world. Okay, I'm not a fan of heat, but the disciples had a front row seat to all of this, all the teachings about God's kingdom, the miracles that Jesus had performed, the clash with the Pharisees, the embarrassment with the family. And at the end of the day, it was within reason that Jesus, the man, was emotionally drained and physically exhausted. But it wasn't over yet. Jesus then had a conversation with two reluctant followers. And we don't know if this pair got in the boat, um, but we do know that Jesus did. Right? And at least some of the disciples that were on board uh, knew what they were doing with, with a boat. Not all of them. You, know, you got one that's a doctor. You got one that's a, uh, a tax collector. You've got a few that, that really have their, their line of work more inland. So there was a, at least four that knew what they were doing with this boat. And he gave them direction to go to the other side. On the eastern shore was the Gentile city of Hippos. And this was part of the Decapolis. The journey across the Sea of Galilee would have taken a couple of hours. But if we look closely at what Jesus says in Luke 8.22, let's cross to the other side of the lake. Literally, Jesus was talking about setting a point of sail, probably a broad reach, nice, gentle, you know, just going to skim across straight away, right? On a direct journey, gentle journey, everything's going to be fine to the other side of the lake. Figuratively, it can be seen as the journey to the other side of life. One reason God allows trials to test our faith along the way is because we're getting to the other side. The other side of good health is illness. The other side of the honeymoon is the work that a solid relationship requires. Another reason God allows trials is for tangible opportunities to demonstrate our trust in the intangible God. Amen. How will we respond? 
the disciples responded by casting off and making for deep water. Jesus had taught the disciples by what he said and by what he did. He did not, he did not provide them with, with opportunities for, for negative influence to come in. And it's not enough to learn a lesson or be able to repeat a teaching. It has to be applied. They were, they were about to be tested. Jesus was going to see how much did they really learn. After all, hearing of God's word is intended to produce faith. Romans 10, 17 tells us that. And faith must always be tested. And they were about to be tested. They didn't know it. Pop quiz. Okay? But a storm was coming from the, from the other side. On this side, things were exhausting but going well. On the other side, things were about to get tough. When the storm occurred, it was at the end of that exceptionally long day. Not even a waterlogged boat rocked by fierce waves was going to wake up Jesus. Luke tells us in 823, the storm came up quickly. The storm was so severe that the boat was swamped and they were in grave danger. Mark describes this event as a fierce storm and the waves were breaking into the boat and beginning to fill it with water. Matthew stresses to us that a great storm suddenly arose and behold, there arose a violent storm on the sea so that the boat was being swamped by waves. The word violent comes from the Greek word seismos from which we derive our word for earthquakes. So Matthew is emphasizing that the sea was shaking. This is not a typical storm. Several of the disciples were professional fishermen. Peter, Andrew, James, John. Right? They went back to what they knew. And they knew these waters. They knew how to handle a boat in a storm. Sometimes storms on the Sea of Galilee are too dangerous for even the most skilled fishermen, and the disciples were soon out of their depth. Come on, Isaac. Okay. This time, however, they were facing waves many feet high, breaking over the boat and beginning to fill it. This is not to mention the hurricane-strength winds, that this storm was producing. This storm must have been worse than anything that they had ever experienced before. These expert sailors were unable to regain control of their boat or bring it safely to shore. They came to realize that they were in grave danger. Is there any other kind? No, just grave danger. Due to the fierceness and intensity of the storm, they must have believed they were going to die We get a sense of panic from the disciples as all of this was happening. Their concern about drowning is completely normal, and it's reasonable. During all of this, Jesus remained asleep in the stern of the boat. Waves crashing, rain coming down, hurricane force winds, the boat is becoming... You remember, this boat is... Th about three and a half feet draft with seven foot waves. It's not going to take very much to fill up that boat. Sleeping through it, just sleeping through it, sleeping off a very bad day. Right? Did Jesus know that the storm was coming? Absolutely. Absolutely. This storm was part of the lesson for the disciples. Jesus was using it to teach them something incredibly, absolutely incredible about himself, and we'll get to that, and to teach them something about themselves, and unfortunately, we're going to get to that too. This storm was their midterm exam. 
Okay? They've had a spiritual education going on. Time for a test. The theoretical experience of the classroom was entering a phase of practicum. This was the opportunity to put into action all of that classroom stuff okay? and show that they understood the material. They themselves were there and witnessed Jesus heal physical and emotional maladies, cast out demons, teach crowds in words and examples that they could understand. They were also aware that he could teach rabbis, rebbies, and ravs scripture with the authority of the author himself. Paul was all things to all people because he was a Roman and he spoke Greek and he was a Pharisee of Pharisees and a Hebrew of Hebrews. Jesus was doing that too. He could reach people at whatever level they were. As miraculous as his powers are, yes, we're talking about something that happened, but I'm present tense. We, as miraculous as his powers are, they had not yet seen anything to reveal his authority over natural phenomena. So where were we? There was a fierce, fierce and violent storm. The sea was crashing. Uh, it, the, the waves were coming in over the gunnels. The boat is being swamped. And these expert fishermen, well-practiced in all things nautical, were reduced to absolute mayhem. They were convinced that they were about to die. That's right, yeah, the about to die thing. Right, they were about to die. Adrift in a violent storm that was threatening to capsize the boat, the disciples looked to Jesus, and where was he? asleep aft of a midships, presumably unaware of, the, of what was going on. With nowhere to turn, they finally decide to wake up Jesus. It's interesting to see the different ways that the Gospels record how they woke him up. Mark 4.38 and Luke 8.24 tell us that they woke him by shouting, Teacher or master, don't you care that we're going to drown? There's almost a sense of anger. I, I, I get a, I, when I read through, I, I get a sense of anger. Oh, don't, don't you care? Oh. They, they were not awakening him to rescue them, but to invite them into, into their panic. They were not following a seek ye first sort of process the way uh, Jehoshaphat uh, Baresa, king of Judah, did. The city is surrounded on three sides, and, and the end is near. We're going to be overrun. Everything is going to come to a catastrophe. Oh. Prayer and fasting. We're not going to enter this battle. We're going into a period of prayer and fasting. Not what the disciples did. It's not what the disciples did. They were not using the power that they had been given to overcome. They were not drawing on, on what they could. They were drawing Jesus into their despair. They were pulling Jesus down into their situation. Matthew 8.25 tells us the disciples woke him up by shouting, save us, Lord, we are perishing. Okay, now I'm going to butcher this, so bear with me. The Greek word in this verse is sozo. Okay, thank you for not throwing tomatoes. Good. All right. Uh, it's typically translated as save. Okay. Wherever sozo is, is used, it's important to ask three questions. What is being saved? What, it is being sa what is it being saved from? And what is it being saved to? Whenever we encounter sozo or similar salvation passages that, that use this root, 
it's important to always use the context to answer the questions so, we're, so we make sure that we're interpreting scripture correctly. If we assume that every sozo means being saved from hell unto heaven, we're liable to misread what's in scripture. The context is very important. In this instance, his disciples were not asking them, you know, we're not, I should say him, the, the disciples were not asking Jesus to save their spiritual lives from spiritual death. They were not asking to be saved unto heaven. What they wanted was to have their physical lives saved from drowning so that they could see yet another day. Mark 4.39 in the NLT reads, When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the winds and said to the waves, Silence, be still. Suddenly, the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Did you catch that word, suddenly? Yeah, we're, we're going to come back to that in a minute. We're, okay. Suddenly. The way Jesus rebuked the wind implies the adversary may have been behind the storm. This rebuke is the same rebuke that he gave the demon in Mark 125. But Jesus rebuked him saying, be silent and come out of him. There are examples in scripture where the enemy used weather to bring destruction upon people. The quickest reference for most people is from Job. Okay? Job 116, a lightning storm was used to kill Job's sheep and servants. In Job 119, the fallen one used a powerful wind to destroy the house where all of Job's children had gathered and killing them as a result. It's possible that this unexpected storm was an attack of our prosecutor. Whether it was Hasatan or not, Jesus knew it was going to happen. And Jesus had a plan and how to use it according to his purpose. The last part of that verse, suddenly, as in suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. At Jesus' command, silence, be still. The storm stopped in its tracks. Storm tracks? Okay. okay. The storm did not gradually let up. The storm did not eventually clear. The excessive waves stopped. The rain stopped. In the twinkling of an eye, the situation changed from a raging storm into a serene body of water. Mark 4.41 in the uh, New Living, fear grips them again. The disciples were absolutely terrified. Why would they be terrified after the storm had, been, had stopped? Ah, oh, they had just learned something about Jesus. The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked. Even the wind and the waves obey him. Up to this point, the disciples knew that Jesus was unique, one of a kind, if you will. They perceived God was working through him. They had witnessed Jesus heal people of all sorts of disease and cast out demons. The prophets had done as much, but they had also divided rivers and seas. The disciples were scared while Jesus was asleep, but now they were even more afraid. Right? Brother Wong mentioned that, that they, uh, they saw this ghost figure coming at them and they were terrified. They were more terrified of this thing that they couldn't understand than the storm that they were in. They, they'd been through storms. They knew what storms were, but, but this? Somebody walking on the... Right? They knew what a storm was like. They had just been through the storm. The storm was calm, but 
But now, now they were terrified, worse than before. In a matter of seconds, Jesus woke up, yelled into the storm, and it instantly stopped. What they had just witnessed started a significant paradigm shift in the thinking about who Jesus really is, present tense intended. As Matthew proved in his gospel, this man was God. He was the Messiah, the King of heaven, of heaven and earth. Jesus spoke directly into the elements, into the weather, and all things that were made through him and without him was not anything was made. The voice that spoke everything into existence and gathered the waters together on the second day spoke and nature obeyed. God is described in the Old Testament as rebuking the sea. The Lord Most High alone is sovereign over the control of all things in nature. In the Psalms, the Lord is celebrated as the master of storm and sea. But this was completely different. This is the type of power reserved for God alone, and yet they just saw it happen. This is the type of power that we are that we stand in awe. This is who stands with us. This is who stands before us and behind us and on each side of us. This is the power that is protecting us. This is the eye that is going to fulfill every prophecy. It gives us an even greater sense of the authority of our creator. Psalm 89, 8 through 9. Our Lord... God of hosts, who is, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you, you rule the raging of the sea. When, it waves, when the waves rise, you still them. Psalms also tell us that God is going to show himself in his authority. Psalm 65, verses 6 through 8. The one who by his strength established the mountains, being girded with might, who stills the roaring sea, the roaring of the waves, the tumult of the peoples, so that those who dwell at the ends of the earth are in awe of your signs. Jesus had just demonstrated his authority over nature. The disciples began to learn more about Jesus and who he really is. They had never seen a display like this, ever. As was pointed out downstairs in Sunday school, if you study physics, a human being cannot walk on water. Okay? This, is the same, this is the same type of thing. Only God can control weather. And they were gaining this revelation of who Jesus is and his power and all that he possesses. This, this is an incredible illustration of what Emmanuel really means. We see both aspects of Jesus in a matter of moments. We see the humanity of Jesus and the deity of Jesus. The humanity of Jesus is seen in his absolute exhaustion. And then after a little sleep and with nothing to eat, Jesus had to deal with Pharisees and family and teach people on, on their level through a number of Pharise uh, through parables and handled crowds and dealt with the disciples and endured the sun's heat. And when he had the chance to sleep, he took it. And he was sleeping so hard that even the storm didn't wake him up. He was totally exhausted. And then we have the deity of Jesus as seen through his power over the storm. He displayed his omnipotence and power over nature as only the creator can. We have God in flesh. 
we have the incarnation of God. When we are in the middle of a storm, it is there that God can, can demonstrate to us who he is very clearly, if he so chooses. There are a lot of, a lot of lessons that we can learn about God in the middle of a storm. When the disciples gained more understanding, they shrank in fear and Jesus criticized their lack of faith. When his disciples came to Jesus, fearful of the storm, he asked them, why are you afraid? Then he calls them, okay, again, your, your understanding with the Greek thing. He calls them oligo, oligopistoi, meaning little faiths. This moniker is translated here as you men of little faith. Jesus' response is directed toward their lack of faith, not toward them personally. Their response serves up as a wake-up call to them, as it does for us. Now, if we go back to, uh, to the recent Sermon on the Mount, we are told, uh, we are told that uh, just as it's recorded, in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 27. Um, I have it in the ESV. Um, I believe Malcolm's going to bring it up in uh, the King James. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. It is not, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of his life? Why was their response a lack of faith? In crisis, the visible and the repeated evidence of what has been done in past situation overrides the invisible and the evidence of things unseen. These men were experienced fishermen. But they had been on the water all of their working lives, and probably even before that. They were confident that whatever happens on the Sea of Galilee, they could handle. I bet when this storm came up, they simply prepared to face it as they had done so many times before. And the storm began to sway the ship and everything was gonna be fine. I can imagine the disciples that were, that were trying to pilot the vessel reassured everything that things were under control. Everything's gonna be fine. Eventually though, everyone on the ship realized that things were not under control. Things were beyond their control. And that's when they began to panic. And Jesus was right to call them out. Their faith was not in God, but in their own abilities. When they realized that their faith was in something powerless to help them, their own understanding in this case, they panicked. Jesus was calling them to be more than their worldly roles. He was calling them to give their lives over to him. He had told them of his plans way in advance, way in advance, that they should trust him and that he would see things through to completion for them. Mark 1.17, and Jesus said to them, follow me and, I will, uh, and you will become fishers of men. Mark 3, 13 through 14, and he went up on the mountain and he called to him those who he desired and they came to him, and he appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach. They had to learn to fully give their lives to him for his purposes. One of them did not surrender to him. 
of the 11 who did, 10 went on to martyrdom, and one went on to exile. The cost of discipleship can be very high. If you're, ever, if you're ever curious about how your spiritual life is going, how many times you under attack by the enemy? Okay. The more you're under attack, the bigger the target you have. The bigger the target you have, the more time you spend with God. Okay. I'm sure that you're all familiar with the, with the classic physics demonstration on the, con uh, the uh, conservation of energy. It uses a pendulum. Okay, no? Okay. A bowling ball, 15-pound bowling ball, is affixed to a rope. Okay? And the rope is attached to the ceiling. The professor explains that if a student puts her back against a wall and pulls the bowling ball up so it touches her chin and then lets it go, it will not hit her when it comes back. With each swing of a pendulum, it has less of an arc than the previous one. This is a great way to see how much the student trusts the professor. OK, not at all. All right? The student will reflexively, because we have this inborn reflex to you know, self-preservation, right? will reflexively move out of the way as the bowling ball is swinging straight toward her face. OK, logical. Right? It's what people do. The student, out of this natural impulse, demonstrates a lack of trust in what the professor has taught. The professor is teaching truth to a classroom full of people. Scientifically proven truth. And yet this, this particular student, mm, she may believe that the professor knows what he's talking about. Okay? She may believe that the math all over the whiteboard that proves that that 15-pound solid mass is not going to hit her in the face. She can believe the math. The elements of belief are not the same as the elements of faith. Faith is trusting that belief when it's your face on the line. Okay? Like the students who declared that they believe in the laws of physics or faith is, uh, is proven in difficult times. The student moves out of the way of the ball, demonstrates a lack of faith in what the professor has said. Okay? We say we believe what God says. Do our lives reflect that belief? As a result of being human beings, we sometimes misplace our faith. We worry and we complain, even when no one is interested in hearing us complain. That is the whole art of kvetching. Right? My people have this down to an art. Okay? When we demonstrate faith, even during our storms, we are able to rest in the confidence that God is in control. Sister Piper had a song for us to help us in praising God that talked about our confidence in God. God is in control. And like Jesus, we can sleep well in any situation. We are called to have faith in God, to trust him completely, to believe everything he says is true and will come to pass. Yes. True faith in Christ Jesus is more than just believing what he said is true. It's, pro it's proving we believe by the way we live in times of testing. Yes. Having faith in God means trusting that he knows what he's doing. Well, it's very easy for us to sit here and say, oh, yeah, God always knows what he's doing. Yeah? 
And how many times are we late for work because of that, that red light that we never get? Today, we got that red light. Oh, I'm going to be late. God knows what he's doing. It means living according to his plan and his rules. It means even when we don't understand, we continue to trust him anyway. Having faith in God means we believe he can intervene in any situation, no matter how dire, and calm every storm around us in an instant. Having faith in God also means we will rest comfortably in him, whether he calms the storm or allows it to rage on. Sometimes he calms the storm. Sometimes he calms his child. In his sovereign wisdom, the Lord also allows storms to capsize our lives. Anybody familiar with capsizing? Yeah. That's when the bottom of the boat is suddenly facing the sky. Not a good, not a good situation to be in. But sometimes God allows that to happen, and that's okay. As long as it's not your 16th birthday and you, and you come down with pneumonia. That was, that was a rough time. But I didn't realize that it was a test because at 16, I knew that the name would be revealed, but that's all I knew. Okay. The Lord allows these storms to remind us of our weakness, but also to remind us of his strength. The Lord allows storms to strengthen our faith in him. The Lord allows storms to give us a fuller picture of who he is. The Lord allows storms to test our faith so we might know him more fully and come to trust in him and his strength and not in our own. These storms point out where we need to go to strengthen ourselves. They're not to be condemning. They're not supposed to be the end of everything. They, I mean, it might feel catastrophic, but this is just a reminder of, yeah, you've been doing some good things, but here's where you're still a little weak. Work on this. Right? We tend to go along through most of our lives feeling like we have things completely under control, and most of our lives are managed, and no matter whatever comes up, we've got this. But then things that never really bothered us add up, and we enter into a state of panic. We feel we have lost control. We feel overwhelmed. We feel that we're drowning. It's not uncommon for us to have faith in our own experience and our proven ability to adapt. We can put our faith in our church, in our family, in our friends, in doctors, in money, or whatever else. We have faith that the problems we face can be solved no matter what they are. And that works for us most of the time. But there are times that these objects of faith are well indeed sufficient to solve the problems we face. But sometimes they're not. It is how we respond to these problems that escalate to a full-blown storm that separates belief from faith. When a storm comes, do we think of God for, for who he is and, and how good he is for allowing this to happen? When a storm comes, do we see God as caring? When we, when we are in a storm, do we believe in God the same way? When bad things happen, it does not mean that God has abandoned us. In his infinite glory and wisdom, God has chosen to allow these storms to come into our lives. True faith trusts God even in times of trials, even if God allows death, disease, poverty, ridicule, or anything else to enter our lives. He is still in control, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. When a storm comes, the mud and the muck from the seabed is churned up to the surface. When a, storm, when a storm comes, what comes to the surface 
is what's deep inside each of us. The storm reveals to us whether we live by fear or by faith. Storms reveal what is the predominant content of our heart, whether it is trust or doubt. How we react to God during a storm reveals the truth about ourselves, not the truth about God. And yet we project that onto him as if it's his failing. When we face storms in our lives, we panic. We feel helpless because we have trusted something that did not last. We trusted in something that is insufficient as a substitute for God. Our faith has been misplaced. Jesus was right in condemning the, the disciples for their lack of faith, and he would be right to condemning you and condemning me. The world's propaganda, propaganda ministers on Madison Avenue are counting on us to misplace our faith. Their goal is to make, it, make us feel so insecure about ourselves that we will buy whatever product of the week that they're pushing. If we will just buy whatever, we'll have nothing to worry about. As a result of a media blitz and peer pressure, uh, many people feel a sense of panic, anxiety, and even guilt if they choose not to buy this, that, or the other. They're being robbed of their peace. The world tells us over and over again, if we just put our faith in whatever shiny round thing they force, to, they force in our face, we'll feel secure and that we won't need to worry. Okay, let me tell you, that is a lie from the pit. It's not feelings that take away worry or make us secure. It is the fact that our peace and our security is because of who he is. Most, Bible tra most Bibles translate, uh, I am that I am. Personally, I think it's a little lost in translation. The voice that instantly calmed that storm also spoke from a burning bush that was not consumed. Iye, asher, iye. I am all sufficient unto myself, or equally translated as, I am that is all sufficient unto myself. Our confidence must be placed in the Lord, in the I am. Let the world panic as we live by faith because our faith is in God and we don't have to buy into the lies of the world. We won't feel ourselves being pulled in a thousand different directions. We won't be paralyzed with fear. We'll be able to keep working hard when they're talking about layoffs. Work as, as unto the Lord. We will be shown a way when our schedules say there is no way because they are beyond packed with things that we have determined are all top priorities. There is a very simple way to calm the storm. We need to recognize the voice that said, silent, be still. That voice is in control. We are not. We have never had control. We currently do not have control. We will never have any control over any situation in our lives. Okay? Okay? We are completely dependent upon God to take care of us. True faith is not only believing that God is able to take care of us. True faith trusts that God is sovereign. It trusts the way that God takes care of us. Then we do what we can do and what we are called to do. Some of us are headed into a storm. Some of us are in the middle of a storm and some of us are coming out of a storm. We need to learn from our storms. Jesus is teaching us something about himself. 
Jesus is teaching us something about ourselves. When we come out of the storm, we won't be the same as when we went in. Right? Right? When, we, when we come out of the storm, we're stronger for it. We're better for it. We're closer to him for it. Right? And that's what storms are all about, Charlie Brown. Right? We will see Jesus differently. We will see ourselves differently. There is something that we can only learn in a storm. Some storms leave a wake of destruction. Some storms clear a path. Storms help us see something more clearly. Have you ever looked in the sky, into the sky after a storm pulls away? Beautiful. Okay? Jesus reminds the disciples that God is bigger than every storm. God can stop a storm with a single word. The winds and the waves obeyed him instantly. The same is true as the storms that we face. Odds are we will never find ourselves in a boat with a three and a half foot draft being swamped by seven foot waves. Odds are we will find ourselves in a supervisor's office, in a hospital waiting room, on a gurney going into surgery, in court, at a funeral home, in front of a stack of bills, or any other number of storms. Okay? In those times, we must remember that God can calm all of our storms. And if he doesn't, he's got a good reason. Okay? We need to trust his judgment more than our own. Very easy to say, very hard to do. How do we develop this kind of faith? I suspect that, that we would all find it a little tough to stand in front of a bowling ball, swinging straight at our face. But what if it was a Nerf ball? How many people remember Nerf balls? OK. OK, we got some of the young people remember a Nerf ball. OK, good. So, so this is still a legitimate thing. OK, so what if it was a Nerf ball? and not a 15-pound block coming straight at you, right? If we thought it wouldn't even hurt when it hit us, we'd probably be willing to stand firm and see what happens. God uses lots of opportunities with Nerf balls before we ever face a bowling ball. God has given commands about how we live our lives, and we often try to duck out of some of those. And we, we just refer to those as little things, right? If we want to develop and strengthen our faith, we must try to stand firm in the little things. Because right? in those areas where there isn't a lot of risk, we need to say to God, I don't understand why you want me to do this, but I'll do it anyway. If we do this, we will see God that, and God knows what he's doing, even in the little things, and over time, we'll learn to trust him in the big things. We need to ask ourselves whether we truly trust God. If we really believe God's promises and God's character, our lives will reflect it. If we truly trust God's sovereignty, we will not be people who panic, but people who have calm confidence, no matter what we face. Why can we be calm? We are not calm because, of, uh, because we are confident that God will calm a storm. We are calm because we are confident that God can calm a storm. We are calm in all things. And if he doesn't, he's using it to accomplish something that is fitting with his will. True faith trusts in the will of God in every circumstance, whether we understand it or not. Okay. How can we be calm? Three recommendations. One, walk with God. What does faith during a storm look like personally in your walk with God? Two, keep Christ first. 
What does faith during a storm look like personally when we keep Christ first? Three, keep sin out of your life. What does faith during those types of storms look like personally when you're trying to accomplish this? By holding on to Christ and his promises with absolute certainty, regardless of the storms, will pass quickly or not. We go through it not only under his sovereignty, but with him at our side. And here are the six takeaways from today. Storms are a test. One, storms are a test. We must keep our faith in Christ even during the storms. He is sovereign over everything. And are we, are we all heat and no flame? Is our passion for Christ being choked out by competing passions and things of the world? Storms test and reveal our faith whether we need to strengthen our faith in corporate prayer, private prayer, study, or reading the word. Storm three. Storm, uh, is this two or three? Storms can happen suddenly. Storms are a reality of life. One moment, everything seems to be going well, then the phone rings, and everything changes. Job 14.1, while he was praying to God, Job observed his life was full of troubles. In John 16.33, Jesus said, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Three, Storms can cause you to doubt God. It's one thing to learn something about God or yourself sitting here, listening to the foolishness of preaching. It's another thing to learn something about God or yourself when you're in a destructive storm. Some lessons can only be learned in the middle of a storm. If we have musicians, please. Four. Storms can teach you about God. Jesus is all-sufficient unto himself, and we live in that overflow. He wants us to have life and to live it more abundantly. And he's willing to offer us everything that he has. We have to provide him with everything we have. The one who wants to share eternity with us is more than sufficient to bear us up and conquer all of our fears. Five, storms can teach you about yourself. They asked, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? They called Jesus teacher, not Lord. They questioned his love and concern for them. Their fear blinded them to who he is in the middle of that storm. And we will learn about ourselves in that storm we will learn how strong our faith really is. And last, storms will stretch your faith. Repent. There is always something to confess to God. Give. There is always something that we can sacrifice as an offering lifted up to God. Minister. There is always something we can do in service to our neighbors and thus unto God. Ask. There is always something to request of God that is according to his will. Rejoice. There is always something to praise God for. Jesus demonstrated his authority by taking control of the storm. He demonstrates his role as the only one worthy of our faith and that of all humanity. He shows this in his ongoing role throughout creation. Have you ever looked at a sunset? Then I say you've seen Jesus, my Lord. This altar is open. The one who is all sufficient for each of us is the one who is all sufficient unto himself. Spend some time with the one who is the way and the one who makes a way when there seems to be no way.